Okay, if folks are coming back, we are going to try this again for those that are coming back. We think that we have been able to get our panelists. Okay, do we have okay. better luck this time? With you, we have you here. <laughs> Just to be you. Uh, okay, let's see, let's, let's cross our fingers. Time. Yeah, we'll see, hopefully we'll get the others. But those of you that are rejoining, we had to restart our, our Instagram live chat on coming out for mental health. Bear with us as we get our other two panelists joined. Saw Jasmine in the comments again. Yeah, I'm trying to add Jasmine. It's still, it's not letting me. And there's Ricky. Still not letting me let Jasmine in. Okay, those of you that are joining us, we're just trying to add our other two panelists. David, are you able to send a request to them to join? Um, where I can only send requests to people that I believe, well, let me see. I'm gonna say follow, let me get the names right. <clears throat> Let's see. Maybe you need to follow them as well. I'm not sure if that's a thing, but it might be. Okay, I just invited Ricky. We'll see what that looks like. I tried adding them and it said unable to join still. Okay, well, I don't know how I can add. It seems to be an Instagram issue. It's only letting us have one person. Hmm. All right, folks, please bear with us a little bit. Well, I'm going to continue to try adding them. I'm being told that we should continue going on. So maybe if we aren't able to get our other panelists joined, we can have a conversation and maybe we can do another event. Uh, I know we're already taking up a lot of your precious time, um, but um, we can try to figure some things out later on because it's not accepting anybody. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah. Kind of going forward? Okay. Yeah. So for those of you that are new who missed the introduction, this is our Steve Funds coming out for mental health live chat. We were supposed to have two other panelists with us, um, but right now we're only able to get one of our panelists on board. We're gonna work to get the other two on board 
um, as we go through. But for sake of time, let's go ahead and get through some of um, the chat that we had planned for today. Um, as you all know, yesterday was World Mental Health Day. Today is National Coming Out Day. And so we wanted to talk about the intersection of coming out in mental health and wellness. Knowing that, you know, from personal experience as somebody who's been on um, his coming out journey for, geez, now 25 plus years, um, I can say that my mental health and wellness has definitely been impacted by the various ways that I've come out over the course of uh, my life so far. Um, and so we want to start out, though, by defining what coming out is, knowing that it's something that looks different for everybody. There's not a one size fits all uh, process. And it's also something that usually just doesn't happen once. It's often a lifelong journey. And so I'm wondering, um, <clears throat> Jared, as we start off our conversation, if you can tell us from your experience what coming out means to you. You know, I, for me, coming out meant like fully accepting yourself. When I came out, um, well, I didn't actually come out. <laughs> I think I told Danielle this. I didn't actually come out. My parents found a letter in my backpack. Uh, I mean, they had a sneaking suspicion that <laughs> their son was gay. Uh, so they like went looking for something and they found it. They found a letter in my backpack. Um, but in that moment, I remember thinking like, this is who I am. And it's kind of like, y'all are my parents and I love y'all, but take it or leave it because this is who I am and I can't lie or pretend to be one thing or the other even at such a young age because i feel like most other kids my age weren't quite that brazen um i don't know i just i just didn't care and for me uh coming out was uh, bravery just saying like fuck it i don't care what anyone thinks this is who i am and you can like it or not do you want to share um how old you were when when this happened yeah, I was like 15 or 16. It was around like my sophomore year of high school. And there was a, um, a straight boy that used to like mess with me a lot. And, uh, you know, I got the balls to write him a letter and then my parents found it. <laughs> yeah, I like how you did straight in quotes. Um, I often think that some of our bullies that were right. um, other male identified people probably dealing with some sexual orientation issues themselves that result in the bullying that occurs. Yeah, very, not a similar story, but I came out to my family after already having coming out to a group of friends. Um, uh, my mom, um, which I wasn't quite sure what to, re how, what to imagine the reaction would be. Remember, I was 23 years old. I had mm. already created so many different narratives in my mind about the possibilities of it going wrong from a very early age. Mm. Um, so the reaction with my mom was quite the opposite. It was, um, first she kind of braced herself um, and then she said, I've been waiting for this. Um, I kind of suspected something. And then she, the first response was, if anybody has anything to say, F them. And she used the F word. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm like, we don't have to go that far. No one has said anything to me so far, but I'm happy to know that I have someone here who has my back and that my mom wasn't going to be someone um, who, um, who would uh, unaffirm me, but was actually valid. Yeah. And that was really important for me yeah. to be able to have that as a foundational part of my coming out journey. And yeah. I realized that that's not the same for everybody and that there's a yeah. lot of blessings in there that I should, that I need to make sure that I don't take for granted. Yeah. It, I mean, it definitely is. Cause like, Honestly, I love my parents, but I would have loved it. That was their response. You know, um, it was a different time when I came out and I'm also, I'm from Louisiana. My father was a pastor. So it's like, even culturally, it's just different. Um, and so the response was not affirming at all, but in like some weird kind of way, I think them pushing back against it is what made me be even more brazen. Like, I, if you liked it, okay. But now that you don't like it, now I'm really gonna go full force. Like this is who I am, and I don't care. And it was interesting that kind of their pushback made me kind of tell everybody and just be super open about it. And you know, weirdly enough, I don't think I would have been that open if they would have just been like, oh, okay. Like it gave, like lit a fire in me, if that makes sense, to just share my story and to not care what people thought. No. It's I love that you mentioned that, that there's this fire that was actually lit as a product of not being completely welcomed. And I'm wondering, there probably were some resources you'd already developed by that point. I'm wondering if you can pinpoint what was going on for, for that 15, 14 year old Jared that kind of created these resources to where you were able to 
kind of really exert who you were, even in the face of being told that we don't accept this? You know, I did not have any resources. I'm trying to, as you were saying that, I was trying to think, I don't really recall having like really anything because at that time representation in TV wasn't heavy. Like you mentioned Matthew Shepard uh, before we got on this call. And I, I remember that like one of the first big, like, I don't know what you refer to it as bashings or like murder or I don't, I don't want, I don't know. Murder. For, for, yeah. yeah. Um, but his murder was like one of the first times, and this is terrible, but one of the first times I remember seeing LGBT people like on television. Cause I had never, like it just wasn't talked about as much. Um, so I, I really didn't have a lot of resources. I had like, at that time, like maybe one friend who was also, um, who was queer, my friend, my best friend from high school was also black and gay. Um, and that gave me a little bit of wherewithal, but I, I really didn't have a ton of resources. It was a different time and I was in a small town in Louisiana and it was kind of like, um, I remember when my parents found the letter and I think they wanted me to relent and be like, no, no, and I wasn't. Um, and I don't know, it's just that fuel just like kept, kept me going. Um, I wish it's, it's one thing I see when I talk to like younger people, uh, today is how, um, accepting and their parents are just people in their lives and that there are resources. And honestly, a part of me envies it because we didn't have that, but I'm also super proud of the progress that people have made. When I'll have young black kids come to me and be like, oh, you know, my parents just said, okay. And I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> I would have loved if all my parents said it was okay. It was, it was really tense with us for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well into my adult life, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I do hear maybe you had some psychological resources there um, in, in play that allowed you to do that. But it's, I think that idea of representation was, was really critical. You know, I'm, I'm 46 years old, so I'll feel free to throw my, my age out there. And the only representations I had, so the main message was, if you're gay, you're, you're going to have AIDS. And so I thought yes. as a kid, I even had AIDS, even though I'd never had sex. Oh, wow. Or, yes. or blood transfusion or anything like that. Yeah. And the other message was, you know, you're, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're evil. Right. Uh, I grew up yeah. across the street from the Catholic Church, and I was born and raised Catholic. So I consider myself to be culturally Catholic. But those are the dominant narratives. We didn't have um, the TV shows that we We didn't have Pose, right? We didn't have... Right. Um, uh, Will and Grace, right? Back in the day, we didn't even have um, a get. And if there were guest gay characters, they were often portrayed in very stereotypic ways, right? And so our right. the ideas for what we could be, right, were very limited. And so how could I yeah. possibly dream of any life right. um, past anything, right? Because there right. wasn't any kind of roadmap there. Yeah, there wasn't. Um, I mean, you kind of had to make it. You had to make it yourself. I think I was from the generation. I'm 32, so I was from the generation when. Will and Grace had just started. I think Will and Grace started in 98. So Will and Grace just started. And I remember being in church and they would preach sermons about Will and Grace, about how terrible it was. And for me at that time, being gay meant that you were awful um, and that your life was going to be miserable. You're never going to have a good life. Like it's going to be terrible and you're going to go to hell. Um, and I recall at the time when I made the decision to just go full force with it saying like, okay, you know you're making the decision that your life's going to be hard now. And the desire to be who I was was stronger than, I don't know, how miserable I thought my life was going to be. But then as I got older, you start to learn it's not being gay <laughs> that's miserable. It's the BS that sometimes comes with being gay. It's people talking poorly about me. It's people turning their backs on you. That's what's wrong with being gay. Being gay is fun. I love being gay. Like, I love that about me. It's all of those other outside factors. But you learn now, obviously, as time has progressed, that it's, that's not true. It's bullshit. You see so many people thriving in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and I think you know, I managed to get by without that at the time, but that is so important so that people can be like, can, that may hear messages of thinking like, oh, you're terrible, can look at TV or magazine and see like, no, this person is thriving. This person is in the LGBT community and they're doing great things. I can do that too. I don't have to be um, boxed into just having this awful life. Being gay is fun. Join the club, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Definitely, right? No, you're definitely right, right? It's society, it's the systems and institutions in society that all are creating these messages that they expect right, us to internalize so that we are kept in a place that the system wants us to be in. Right. But as you said, we know that's all BS. We know that that's not real. That's, that's all smoke and mirrors, that the reality yes. of who we are is beauty, right? It's brilliance, it's wisdom. Um, and as a collective, there's even greater um, beauty and, and wisdom when we look at kind of the diversity that's inherent in LGBTQ plus communities, so many strengths. Um, I wanna talk about culture. We talked to some about some of our culture and, and race and, and kind of how that has impacted um, our coming out journeys over time. So how, have you, how do you think your race and, and culture <laughs> impacted your coming out journey? Well, um, you know, I'm from Louisiana and, you know, I'm, I'm also black and religion is a very heavy thing within the black community. And sometimes within the black community, it seems like the worst thing you can do is be gay. It's like you can do all these other things, but the worst thing you could do um, is, is be gay. And so for a long time, I, um, even though I did move forward with it, I did internalize a lot of things. Um, I know for one of the biggest things for me uh, for a very long time was this like heteronormative attitude towards what gay relationships are supposed to be like. I mean, I'm 32 and I'm just now starting to break out of that because that was what was taught to you for so long. Um, even, even the idea of kind of like being in a box. I remember when I was growing up, either you had to be gay or straight. There was no bisexual, like you needed to pick a box, you needed yeah. to pick something and that's what you were. And like now we see in today, People are fluid. You are what you are, but at that time, that it just wasn't so much of a thing. Um, I think dealing with uh, all of the ideas of what it means to be a black man and a masculine black man, it can really do a number on you, and it's hard to find your place in the world. Like you said, there wasn't a ton of represent representation when you were coming up, and there was very little when I was coming up. So I didn't really have a blueprint. I had to figure all this out by myself and there were days where i hated myself because i didn't have anything else to pull from all i had was me and i would just have to root myself on like come on jerry like it's okay but that that is very tough when you have all of these different aspects or you like all these subcategories being black and gay it's really difficult trying to figure out who you are i would say that a lot of times um you don't necessarily feel accepted by any community because yeah. i'm black so like you're kind of ostracized in a way or you have to deal with racism from that. But then also within the black community, they don't like the gay. So it's like, well, what do I do? <laughs> like, where do I go? You know, it's yeah. a very difficult uh, road to navigate. Completely everything, many things you said resonated with, um, with my experience, kind of like there's a competing interest with our various identities, competing norms that often don't meld well together. Right. Uh, being Mexican American, uh, machismo is a, a thing that was, you know, not yep. just a thing, but a, a norm um, yep. in the broader culture. But I saw it act its way out in my family via the, the gendered, very gendered roles that men and women, right? Just men and women, there's nothing else, right? So right. Even the idea of expressing gender was extremely limited. And even though we know gender identity and sexual orientation are two specifically unique concepts, they do have some overlaps in terms of how they influence, influence each other. And so yeah. I felt like I had to meet a specific box for how I was supposed to look, how I was supposed to behave, yeah. how I was supposed to emote based off of my cultural values. Number one, you don't emote at all. If you're a Mexican, right. Right? Exactly. All that, you keep it all in. And so right. having this pressure cooker of sorts kind of just build up and build up, you know, I had to, I contended with depression my right. uh, early years of college, probably even before then. Um, but I was also in a family where we didn't have a language for mental health. Probably right. a reason why I became a psychologist. Um, so just having the language, you know, as I started to come out, I started to realize, you know, there's a different language that I now have and I'm able to use to understand myself and then also to communicate myself to other people in a very authentic way. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like these days mental health has become almost like a bit of a buzzword. But at the time when I was growing up, there was no language for it. And I actually did. That was like my first. I don't know, in, interaction with mental health, I actually did go through depression. But at the time, I didn't know that that's what that was because like you said, there was no language for that. I remember just thinking like, oh, well, you know, sometimes I feel sad and I feel down, like things aren't great, but I didn't think there was depression. In my mind, depression was sitting in like a dark room yeah. and crying and yeah. it, was, it was all these like super extreme things. Um, so even 
even if my parents wanted to help me with my mental health, I didn't even have the words to say in the first place and I'm struggling with this. Yeah. So they wouldn't have known how to do it. It just, exactly. it was such a different time and we just didn't, we did not talk about those things. And, you know, again, I will say that being gay is not bad. It's the things that come with it. That's what was making me depressed. Like literally, I remember one time being at church and the youth pastor and his wife pulling me into the <laughs> office. I don't know what's going on. And then they pulled two other kids in there and they basically, they wanted to pray the gay out of us. Um, and they, I mean, they tried to, I'm still gay, but they definitely gave it their best shot. Um, but all of those things can weigh on you and make you feel like, am I a bad person? Like, even though you know you're not, you're like, is something wrong with me? Like, am I bad? Like, why is everybody making me feel like this for just being myself? And it takes a very long time. And I know for me, I still struggle with anxiety and depression because of things that happened at that time. Cause it was just, it was so heavy and i think it was coming at me from like family school church like every aspect of my life it was coming at me and it in a in a way i think almost the fact that i didn't know that i was depressed helped a little bit because i didn't indulge it too much i just was kind of like come on jared like just get through it but it was bad i remember saying that there were a few times that um my brother and sister are very are very close to me and um they know i'm gay and they were always very accepting for it. but i remember thinking that if i didn't have them in high school i would have probably either ran away or committed suicide or died from suicide because mm -hmm. yeah. it was just such a it was a it was really rough time and i can only imagine like how it was when you were coming up it's just outrageous the type of hatred people want you to like adopt for yourself and it's like but I love me. Why are you like, I don't want to hate myself, but they, they want you to, they really want you to dislike yourself. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I, I, I uh, what it makes me think of is that that young Jared was hurting so much, yeah. so much intense pain. And again, not from truly being gay, but from the experiences of the outside to you, right? That kind of created that, that pressure and sent those messages. And even if we don't believe those negative messages about being gay or about being queer, they're so dominant in society that inevitably we believe some of them. And yeah. that, when that impression gets internalized, and from my perspective, that is one of the most damaging um, events that could happen is when we start to then believe these oppressions, yeah. see how it keeps people from optimizing their fullest potentials, reaching for their dreams. If you're told you're nothing your whole life, you're gonna to start to reach for nothing. Right. It is crazy how like you can be the most confident person, but if someone keeps throwing that at you, you might not even fully believe it, but you may have a moment where it's like, well, am I that? Or you'll start right. to like question things that you would never think to question before, but it's, it's hard. Like you'd have to be a robot not to when that's constantly being thrown at you like that. Totally, totally, yeah. And thankfully, we're not robots. And I've seen so many, so much smiles just right now. And in your eyes, I can see uh, cheer and happiness. So I imagine your life is much different now compared to 15, 16, 17-year-old Jared. And when I reflect on mine, I know that my life is much different now in terms of how I understand myself and how I understand those around me. It's much more positive. So I'm thinking, you know, there are so many strengths um, that we can gain over the process and journeys of coming out, so many strengths that we gain as being openly queer people. I'm wondering if you can name what some of those strengths might be that have helped you to get where you are. Um, I mean, I, I said this earlier, it's been a big like confidence booster and to just not really give a fuck about what people think. And there is something that is amazing about that. Now I will say again, at 32, I'm still working on all of that. Um, but it is kind of like living loud and proud really helps you to be like i'm gonna do what's best for me and you can say whatever you want to and that's fine you can have all the opinions in the world but that doesn't mean i have to abide by them like as much as in a weird way as it as much as it can tear your confidence down it also kind of builds it up because you almost have to like overcompensate and be like i'm here i'm queer deal with it you know like i'm gonna be in your face and this is what it is but like at some point for me it stopped being overcompensating and it started becoming reality. And I did believe it. And I didn't need your opinions on me anymore. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest ones. The strength is that it, it really did um, build my confidence. And it made me more um, resilient. You mm -hmm. know? In spite of like people saying nasty things or setbacks or all this, like, you gotta keep going. 
You got to keep going. You can't give up because they want you to give up. You got to keep going. Yep. Completely agree. Someone has written in here, resilience and self-awareness, living loud and proud. Uh, this yeah. self-awareness, though, I believe we spend so much time, many of us have spent so much time um, in the closet, right? I spent up until my early 20s contemplating all of these issues. But through even that process of pre-coming out for the first time, I developed a lot of self-awareness about who I was and and what the world was about. Um, and that really helped me. But through the process of coming out, which I'm still coming out to this very day, I'm sure there are folks that I've come out to um, who didn't know me before on this um, this live chat. Um, but I developed that um, those resiliency factors that that have kept me intact, um, not only just to to kind of live, but because of that, I think that process of sometimes overdoing it, right, to be authentically unapologetic about who we are, sometimes we have to say it bluntly, out loud, and very loud, um, and, and however that may look, not just verbally, but physically, emotionally, mm -hmm. really, et cetera, but that that can boost one's self-confidence. I honestly believe, I believe what happens is that it helps to put our dignity back intact because our dignity gets eaten at via all these aggressions that we endure before we come out while we're coming out until the day that we die and i think that the processes of coming out can actually help when um it's accessible and when it's safe right knowing yeah. that it's not always safe and accessible for everyone to come out in the same way right exactly um, I'm looking at our time. I know we initially were going to go to 6.45. I'm going to let them put that in the comment if that's when they want us to end. Um, but I want to think about some messages that we can give folks. I know that if anybody's been listening, they probably are already going to take away a lot of um, uh, knowledge from your experiences, um, Jared. I'm wondering um, what you might say to um, a younger person right now who is contemplating coming out. What, what kind of um, suggestions might you give them for navigating that process? Um, I mean, I think the most important thing is, like, you have to determine if you want to come out and when you should come out. You cannot let anybody else do that for you. And I know it sucks because sometimes that happens because that's obviously what happened to me. Um, but you have to be in control. And when you feel comfortable enough to do that and say that and to live in whatever your truth is, then you should do it. Um, but on the other side of it, and I know this is going to sound so corny, but it really does get better. It's not going to stay bad like that forever. Like, I know my relationship with my parents was really bad um, at one point, and now they accept it. And when they finally started to accept it, like, I was shocked myself because I never thought that they would come, but it came from me just standing in who I was. It's like, well, I'm not going to come over to you all side, so y'all need to come on over to mine and just learn to accept it and get over it. Um, so, yeah, I think it does get better. It does get better and come out when you feel like you are ready to come out don't let anybody force you into doing that this is your journey they can't live your life for you say that again this is your journey right we can't right. live their life for them and it's very personal it's very unique you know I, I i often think about um assessing what are my supports in my life right i need knew that you know social support is one of the 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 main things that gets us through our tough times mm -hmm. we're social creatures by nature and so really buying into that idea and knowing that there probably are people in your life that are safer, right, to come out. No, I used to just do little tests. I would like look at how people would respond to different queer type cues and, and then use that to, to kind of be my data for, okay, this person might be okay with me coming out or at least be willing to hear it and then we can figure it out. But I'll say as, as Jared um, says, you know, it's been very, um, helpful for me in many ways to come out um, because it's been it's it kind of opened up that world i'm looking at a message here and i don't want to forget that um something that we'd want to relate to an ally or a friend who is on this journey i think is something that we also want to cover as well um but 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 really um that that process of coming out not only what it did for me is allow me to kind of share people share my own truth which is important right we can't be um authentic if we're not allowed right from ourselves and from society to share right. authentically who we are but the other part is that it increased my social support network regarding issues of my sexual orientation so now folks actually knew and i can turn to folks for support right. so i don't have to bear that all by myself like i had been before yeah i mean it's, it's tough to try to take that on by yourself that's why i love to see the progress that we have now like you can truly form these communities now and at the time i feel like everyone was so busy trying to hide who they were and 
it's a little bit different now and that's that's beautiful i feel like for each generation it gets just a little bit easier to number one accept who you are but to find people who love you for who you are not that are going to tear you down because that is such an instrumental part especially when you're young since i know that like the steve fund focuses on younger kids like that's young that is so important at that age hey you need to be built up so that you can have the confidence to face off the BS that sometimes comes in the world. Like you need that confidence. You don't need to be torn down from like your fundamental age because that sits with you. Uh, that's why, like, you know, I said at, in my early thirties, I'm just now starting to figure out who I am authentically a hundred percent without all of the other, like this heteronormative and you got to act like this, put some bass in your voice and all these things like that are super just toxic. Um, you, you you need that, you need that. Yeah. And I'm seeing so many examples, given the dramatic increase in representation um, in the media, in the in, in the news, you know, unfortunately, legally, there, most of the representation we hear are anti-LGBTQ yeah. initiatives these days, but we have so many movements and initiatives that are countering that, um, even if it's not from a legal perspective, but it's gonna get there. You know, I, I have faith that that you know, people can't wipe us away. We've been in existence since humanity has been in right. existence, right? And we're gonna continue to be in existence regardless of what a law says I can or cannot do. That's gonna make it more difficult for me. And I know that there are ways of getting through this, right? Um, right. Our communities have done this in many ways. And I mean, our broader communities, our racial communities, our, our uh, spiritual communities, our, 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 um, in, our, in our gender and sexual orientation communities. Somebody had asked about um, other various identities. So maybe we talked about um, geography, religion. I'm wondering if there are any other parts of your identity, um, Jared, that that um, are kind of complementary parts of your queerness. Hmm. Any other aspects of me that are complementary? I mean, <laughs> I think having like a larger personality definitely grew from that. It's like when you're younger, and you're gay, you just want to blend in and you don't want anybody to see you. Because like for the longest, I just wanted to be a wild, wild wallflower. Um, and as I got older and I started to get more comfortable, I was like, no, like I have a big personality. I'm funny and I want everybody to see me now. Like I want to stand out now. I don't want to be a wallflower. Like I'm amazing. Why do I need to blend in with the wallpaper? Um, but when you hear for so long that you're not, like you start to believe it. But now I'm like, I don't care about fitting in. I don't care about blending in. I just want to be me. And if you like it, that's great. And if you don't, that's fine too. <laughs> right. That's fine as well. Move on. <laughs> right. Right. That's the thing, right? Part of this journey means that some people are going to grow much, much more closer to us. And inevitably, some might grow further away from us. And part of life means that we say goodbye to things, right? right? nothing is permanent including relationships unfortunately um, yes. that doesn't mean we have to uh, dissolve them prematurely or what have you but just to kind of know that you know relationships have a lifetime often right are a lifeline sometimes they're in line with our own lifelines and sometimes they're not yep. um, and, and uh, i think about a, a part of my identity that's been complementary it's my profession that i chose as an educator oh, yes. as a psychologist yes. Um, I find a lot of validation in my profession, given that you know, psych there's a whole area yeah. of psychology that studies this, these issues that I've been able to make my professional home. And then so oftentimes my personal home has kind of evolved from those communities as well. And so sometimes our professions can be um, protective sources for, for us. And oftentimes they, sometimes they're not, right? There are still yeah. so many gendered professions um, that uh, I still hear lots of stories of, of overt aggressions towards queer people happening in. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. It's amazing that you've been able to find like a profession that kind of like works with both of those things. I was fortunate that when I first moved to New York City, I worked in fashion, which is full of gay guys. So I was a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I have had friends that um, I had some friends that worked in finance that would say like bags get thrown quite around quite a bit. And it's kind of like, well, especially when you're black and in a corporate space, what do I do in that scenario? Like you kind of it's a hard space to be in. So I feel for people like, for people in those scenarios. Yeah. I feel like the more constricted a profession is in terms of how you're allowed to present yourself. Yeah. And we know the world of business tends to be more restricted. Yeah. Um, and the world of higher education tends to be a bit more and nonprofit tends to be a bit more let loose, right? So we're yeah. gonna differences there. The world of fashion and entertainment tends to be a bit more diverse in terms of, at least recently, right? The, right. The, um, the the kinds of folks that they're allowing to, you know, kind of show 
documentations on on their on different parts of life you know again you can probably flip through every single app that's out there and you're going to find queer representations right hopefully as a major storyline but at least as a significant one and that's that's some progress again looking back to to where we came from i'm wondering as as we close out what kind of final words would you like to live with leave with our listeners regarding um coming out and mental health and wellness uh you know just be you fuck what everybody else says live your best life and be true to who you are because that's that's really all you can do in life just be true to who you are be true to who you are i completely agree um so thank you so much um uh jared for for being here with this conversation you know i'm just um completely enriched myself having had this experience with you and, and hearing um your very personal and and um, meaningful stories and, and sharing that with me and the rest of the world knowing that this might be make its way in many places i think that it's helpful to hear narratives and, and storytelling and i encourage those of you out there to do this in your own circles to share your stories even if you're not gay share your stories or queer share your stories of being a supportive ally because we need to teach people how to be supportive and affirming allies um, we don't want tolerant allies. Nobody wants to be tolerated, right? We want supportive and affirming people, right? right. There are forms of support that can be given. But I want to leave us with the words of one of my uh, most honored queer luminaries, um, who we lost way too soon, Audre Lorde. Um, Audre Lorde left us with so many gifts, um, many gifts that continue to provide us with the hope and inspiration to live another day. Um, we've been talking a lot about the nature of coming out and Audre Lorde's litany for survival is something that those words are very near and dear to me. There probably isn't a day that goes by where I don't reflect or some of the words don't enter into me to kind of help me to kind of be the person that I am. Um, I think of this particular line though from the, the, the litany for survival. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. Ooh. So however you choose to speak your truth, whether it is to one trusted person, a therapist, a support group, or your entire family, know that in sharing, it's not only sharing who you are in your true story, what you're also doing is sharing the weight of the adversity that we all carry right. by ourselves way too often. Oh, that's amazing, David. You have to send that to me after we get off this call. I'll definitely share that with you. Everyone look that up. Audrey Lord's Litany for Survival. It's much longer than this, but it just has so much wisdom in it. And, uh, yeah, the part about knowing we weren't meant to survive is very powerful because it's like, they didn't want us to. Nope, and we, what are we doing right now? We're not only right. surviving, we're thriving. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. We are hosting the IG Live. Look at us, David. Look at us going. <laughs> when I was a young person in Wyoming, there's no way that I thought that I would right. be telling one person, let alone going on an, uh, right. a live feed that can go literally right. around the globe and beyond. Exactly right. Well, Jared, thank you so much for, for being with us. This defund extends its most heartiest gratitude for you taking the time to share your story and your wisdom with us. I personally thank you for enriching my life over the last hour with your stories. And I just really hope that we're able to to stay in contact and collaborate in the future. No, thank you for having me. And you got to bring me back when Ricky and Jasmine can log into Instagram. Ricky and Jack, uh, Jasmine, I am so sorry that this was not working on our end. I. I'm heartbroken that I wasn't able to hear your stories, but we will definitely do something else to make sure those narratives and experiences are heard by the masses. So thank you all. Um, and we will uh, end our chat right now. Take care. Thank you. Bye guys. Be well.